Hi, I'm Ted Santos from Street Talk. We are the talk show made for men, by men, and ladies, you'll never want to miss it. It's actually the best place in the world for women to be able to talk, uh, to actually find out about men and what men really think. And if you haven't heard our shows, they happen every Sunday at 7 p.m. from Eastern Time. And in addition to doing talk shows, we also have a Facebook page called Straight Talk. Straight Talk. If you're not in it, I promise you will want to be in it. Connect with me, Ted Santos, uh, Ted Santos in New Jersey, just in case for some strange reason there's another Ted Santos, if I'm not the only one. <clears throat> and uh, inbox me, let me know you'd like to be in our Facebook group, and you'll find some really interesting conversations where men get to fully express themselves as men. Like, it's that safe space for men to talk about relationships, career, money, uh, social challenges. <clears throat> uh, and it's a place where we get to change the conversation and you really get to hear the man's perspective. And there are an enormous amount of women in the group, so uh, the women benefit as well and we get to interact and engage with them. So, in this video, uh, I'm not here to talk about a specific show that's coming up. <clears throat> I'd like to talk about marriage, but specifically, I want to talk about finding a woman who's really qualified for marriage. And there's a big challenge. So I've probably dated more than my share of women. I've dated women of, of every race, and I've dated women from every continent. I've lived in several countries and dated women in those countries. <clears throat> so I've had an opportunity to see a fair share and a, a very wide spectrum of women. In addition, <laughs> I've dated women born in the 1940s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. So I've seen a, 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 a number of generations I've seen. <clears throat> Uh, different ethnic groups, socioeconomic classes, and I'm going to tell you, there's only about 2% of the women who are hands down really qualified to be great wives. And part of that challenge is, you know, we've had feminists come in and, and say, you know, we want to be equal to men, and women need to be uh, get this great education and then get the jobs that men have instead of giving them to men, give them to women. So we've stopped teaching women how to be great wives. Instead, you tell her to get an education, get a job so that she doesn't have to be a great wife so that when the marriage fails, she can live on her own instead of uh, having to come together with a with a man and really have to cooperate and work well together. Now she doesn't have to give a damn and just can do whatever she wants and say there are no rules and no roles. And when it fails, she can uh, take care of herself. And, and that's what we're getting. And you're, you're seeing more and more women over 45 who have never been married and no children. And uh, that's that's a big part of, you know, it's the upbringing. It's the way we are raising children or little girls. So I want to talk about the 2% right now that makes them very qualified. Uh, if you're a guy and you've met one of these 2%, I'm going to tell you some ways that you can identify her. And I'm going to go down a list. Uh, and I, I would say if you, if you found one, keep her. Like when they, in the old days, they used to say she's a keeper. <clears throat> So, one of the ways that you'll know she's part of the <clears throat> top 2% is she grew up with both biological parents in the house. <clears throat> yep, that's a big deal. Having both parents. Uh, a number of things happen. Having both parents in a house, that woman grew up understanding what cooperation means. She watched her parents have a, a, a great marriage, right? If her parents had a good marriage... They worked together to raise the children. They bought assets, houses, cars. Uh, if both parents worked, if the mother stayed home, it's really, it doesn't matter. She gets to see what it's like to have parents work together as a unit uh, and have affinity towards one another. She also gets to hear her father be a man. 
So there, there's certain ways of being, and there's a certain way that men handle things. There's a certain authoritative, there's a firm way, and I'm not saying women can't do this, but when you have your father and, uh, you know, your parents are, are looking at making an important decision on, on a family matter, and the father, say, if the father can have the last word, so in some things the mother may have the last word because she's... Uh, better equipped, better educated, better experienced in the subject matter. But, you know, and sometimes your father's going to take a stand and say, hey, you know, this is in the best interest of the family. If a woman has never seen that, she would have no idea what it's like to see a man really take a stand and have a, a masculine care for her. And what she will think is, is what you hear is it's toxic masculinity. So a woman who comes from a two-parent household is very important. That's one of the things. The second is that when you meet her, she actually respects you and respects your time. That means she shows up on time. I, I once dated a woman, uh, and imagine, this woman was an attorney. She was a corporate lawyer, and she showed up a little more than an hour late for the first date. We met at a restaurant. She called the restaurant, she was late, and on our second date, I waited, she was late again, I waited 15 minutes, and on the 16th minute, I left. I just, I didn't care, and I didn't have a cell phone at that time, <clears throat> so there was no way she could get a hold of me. But the way I looked at it is, this woman had no regard for my time at all, so I just left. If she didn't care, I, surely I wouldn't care about her. So a woman who shows up on time is really important. Number three, number three kind of relates to number one. Uh, a woman who talks about cooperation. She talks about interdependence as opposed to talking about I'm independent and I can do what I want. You hear women say I can do what I want, when I want, with whom I want. No one is independent, right? No one. This is just a, a uh, delusional myth that people have made up. Even if you're a hermit living out in the woods, in the wilderness, alone in a cave, you still depend on nature. You depend on sunlight, you depend on food, uh, fire, animals, plants. You depend on something. And if you're a woman and you didn't build your own car from scratch, meaning you didn't mine the iron ore uh, out of the earth, you didn't build your own car, make your own shoes, you know, have your own cattle and make the leather. If you're not doing all that, you're not independent. You're depending on men who build roads and build cars. And I understand women uh, work on assembly lines. But men have created these industries. So you're depending on men. If she's talking about being independent instead of cooperation and interdependence. She doesn't belong in that top two. Uh, Number four, it's a good sign if she supports herself 100%. If she's living off of her parents, they're buying her car, they buy her house, <clears throat> she may not have a really good sense of what it takes, what is required to take care of yourself. So if you marry this woman, uh, she may not have a, a good handle on money management. Because mommy or daddy is always there to save the day and buy things. And I understand parents want to take care and spoil their children. But you really take away their sense of, of um, pride to handle matters on their own and mature uh, on their own. And money management is important. So uh, if she doesn't take care of herself 100%, that could be a red flag. <clears throat> Number five, five, the women, women in the top 2%, they value intelligence. They value an intelligent man. Uh, so if you're with a woman who is always disagreeing, even though she knows nothing about the subject matter, there's a good chance she is not intelligent. Therefore, she has no idea how to value it. Now, she may be smart, and if you give her a book and read it and tell her to follow the instructions in the book, she may be fine. However, once you take her out of the uh, 
the confines of what that book and the instructions have given her, she may fail miserably. So all she can do is disagree with you. Uh, there's a term called sapiosexual. That's a person who gets uh, turned on. There's, there is a sexual turn on by being with someone who is intelligent. That's a person who is a sapiosexual. A sapiosexual will definitely value a man who is very intelligent. In fact, uh, it will turn her on and make her uh, want you sexually. Number six. Number six. This one is important. And a lot of guys will relate to number six. She uses logic. She's not disagreeing with you based on just some emotional rant because she doesn't like it. It doesn't sound right. It doesn't resonate. Uh, on one of my shows, we talked about cog cognitive dissonance. And that's when people have this belief system and some new information comes in that makes their belief not valid uh, and they just don't know how to deal with that new information. So they make up some excuse, justification to uh, continue to be right about what they believe. <clears throat> and that's illogical. Uh, so if she uses logic, wow, man. That's a woman you want to keep. Number seven. Seven is going to be important, guys. Because number seven is about sex. And her having a healthy attitude towards sex. If she's having sex with you because she believes she's doing you a favor, she's clearly not in this top 2%. I mean, sex is mutual. You know, it's two... It's a man and woman. Like a screw and a bolt coming together. They, the screw and a bolt work together to fasten or tighten something. Sexual, sexuality is about creating, part of it is about creating life. The other is creating pleasure. And it requires two. There's a intimate, you call connection. There's an exchange. There's an exchange of energy. And if she thinks sex is a way that a man is dominating her and she feels like, uh, she needs to be in control of sex or being she uses sex as a weapon or carrot on a stick. If you do this, I'll do I'll have sex. If you don't do it, I won't have sex. Now, I've ended relationships with women who um, whew, just beautiful bodies. But once they use sex as a weapon, that's you know, there's that's the most intimate thing two people can do together. Once you use it as as a weapon or you taint it or, or misuse it, uh, that hurts the intimacy you have in a relationship. So a woman who has a healthy attitude towards sex is number seven. Um, number eight, and this one is a good one. She actually enjoys being feminine. She enjoys dressing feminine, uh, feminine hair, you watch her movement. Uh, I went into a, there's a Walgreens near me, and there's a woman who, I've, it's right around the corner, and I've been there often, and there's a woman who just started working there, and I, it was interesting, she's just so feminine. If you just watch her, she's, she's a young girl, probably about 20, and just the way she stands and, and takes instructions from a manager, uh, the femininity is, it's, it just, she exudes it. And it's very attractive to see a woman uh, who is so comfortable in her femininity. Uh, like it, it creates the space for your masculinity to come together uh, and, and have a compatible relationship. Feminine and the masculine. So she, having, watching her be comfortable with her femininity is really important. And let's see, what do I have here? So there's another thing, number nine, no, sorry, number eight, number eight. Uh, number eight, 
is that she doesn't have a problem catering to you. You know, in the U.S., women are huge on the man is supposed to take me on entertaining dates. You're supposed to cater to me, open doors, uh, pay for things, uh, help me pay my bills. Even if she's if she has her what she calls her own money and job, she expects you to cater to her. And even in marriage, you know, women are talking about uh, the guy needs to do more chores. You know, there, there's a, a report that says the more chores the guy does, the more likely he's going to divorce. So <clears throat> a woman who is not ashamed to cater to you, I, and part of what I'm saying is if she's demanding something and unwilling to, to give back what she's demanding, She's definitely not in the top 2%. However, if she is willing to give you what she wants, if she's willing to cater to you and take care of you. Like, as men, we know all the things to do to make a woman feel special. What are the things that she does to, for you to make you as a man feel special? If she knows how to do that and she's not ashamed of that, she's a keeper. That's a keeper. Uh, number nine. Number nine is that she's responsible. So if she does something that's inappropriate and you, and you inform her, she will take responsibility for that. Hey, I apologize. I won't do it again. I didn't understand or that was an accident. She will be responsible for it. She's responsible if she gets upset and doesn't know why. <clears throat> uh, I understand you ladies have your menstrual cycle and you can be moody. Uh, but, you know, I'm, I, as a man, I understand when that happens. At the same time, there's some responsi there is 100% responsibility on your part, ladies, when that happens. So when a woman is responsible for her own... Uh, uh, errors, uh, inappropriate behavior, <clears throat> uh, getting upset and not under fully understanding what's going on, and she'll just continue to say, well, this is your fault, you know, that I didn't understand. That's not the woman you want to marry. You want a woman who can also be responsible for her own thinking. If her friends and family are, are telling her how to deal with you in your relationship, if she's going to them to figure out how to deal with things between the two of you, there's a good chance she's not even responsible for what she thinks. She's looking for other people to tell her what to think and do. That's not someone you want. You want someone who's really responsible. And number 10, this one is a big one, and I, definitely for marriage. Your wife, your woman, understands that her husband is the most important person in her life. You know, I read an article by uh, the former CEO of Burberry's. Uh, I forget her name. Uh, Apple hired her and made her the head of the retail division. I think she just uh, resigned <clears throat> this year. She worked several years doing that. And I read an article... And she talked about her priorities in life. Her number one priority was to her husband and to be a great wife. Her number two priority was to be a mother to her two daughters. And her number three was to be a great CEO, her career, her job. And she was not confused. She repeat that, repeated that sequence several times throughout the article. So when a woman understands that or when people understand your significant other is the most important person in your life, not your children, not your job, that creates a great stable environment for your children to grow up in. It creates a much stronger affinity and intimacy between you and your partner. And that's a woman in that top 2%. When she understands you are the most important person in her life, and, I, and I, you need to give that back to her. That needs to be reciprocated. Uh, but that is the kind of environment where you are really empowered because you think about it. <clears throat> you go to bed every night with this woman. You sleep with her every night. 
uh, your choice of where to live, where your children are educated, or how they're educated, how they're disciplined, um, your financial uh, budget, how money is spent, where your vacation, even your job, you know, she'll affect your mindset and how you go to work. Uh, she's a great per person to brainstorm. Uh, she's the person that you're going to share your most intimate secrets. And if you have fears, all of those things, who could be more important than that? Who will alter? Who has the power to alter the way you feel any given moment of the day? That's the most important person in your life, not your parents. Your parents are important. Your siblings, your friends, all important. But the person who influences your life the most is your spouse. So that's my top 10. Uh, grew up with two, uh, two parents, shows up on time, talks about cooperation, supports herself 100%, values intelligence, uses logic, healthy attitude towards sex. Uh, she enjoys being feminine. She actually cares and caters for you and not ashamed of it, responsible for her thinking, and sees you as the most important person in your life. So, uh, give me some likes on this video. Subscribe to me. I'd like to hear your thoughts, your comments about what I just laid out. And if you have something uh, that I missed on this top 10 list, I'd like to hear yours. Uh, thank you, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye.